Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, I'm just going to stay on my toes so that the microphone doesn't have to move. Um, hello and welcome to uh, the first of the season's Clarice Smith Distinguished Lectures with our featured artist, Colleen Smith. I'm Saisha Grayson. I'm the curator of time-based media at SAM and of the exhibition upstairs, Musical Thinking, New Video Art and Sonic Strategies where we're thrilled to be fe featuring several works by Colleen. Okay, give up. This evening, as we convene in DC and in cyberspace, we gratefully acknowledge the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here and wherever you may be, and the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we are gathered, and the labor of the people who are enslaved in constructing this historic building where I stand. And this gathering is significant. The Smithsonian American Art Museum established the Clarice Smith Distinguished Lectures in American Art in 2004 to present new insights in American art from the perspectives of outstanding artists, critics, and scholars. This annual series takes place each fall and is made possible by the generosity of Clarice Smith, who passed away in 2021, leaving this legacy of incredible conversations. This is our 20th year of the series, and it is also our final one. So we begin with um, Colleen Smith, and we continue on October 11th uh, with curator Shirley Reese Hugh of the Eamon Carter Museum, who will speak about her Louise Nevelson exhibition. And on November 8th, critic Mary Louise Schumacher will preview her film, Out of the Picture, which looks at the landscape of art criticism and talk about it with other critics. So thank you for joining over the last two decades for so many memorable lectures. We invite those of you who are here in person to join us after this for a reception in the Kogod Courtyard. Um, but before that, we have a job for all of the audience, whether you're in person or online. As, um, as we're going through the lecture, as Colleen's speaking, please think of questions, because we will invite those at the end of the talk. If you're in the audience, we will gather comment cards. And if you're online and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can put questions in there, and we'll also um, get those um, in person, and I'll moderate that with Colleen later. So also for those in person, this is your cue to turn off anything that makes noise. Do it now. Um, <laughs> So now I begin the fun part of the introductory honors. Um, and I'll try to be brief while signaling the breadth of Colleen's achievements. I was immediately transfixed by her work and its fluid bridging of the worlds of filmmaking and cinematic histories and the immersive, time-based, iterative art that she spins from creative questions into research journeys, collaborative opportunities, and stages for alternative world building. Smith received her MFA from the Uni University of California, Los Angeles, School of Theater, Film, and Television, where she began her first feature film, Dry Long So. This received significant attention when released in 98, and now just this year has been remastered by Criterion Collection, finding new audiences and accolades with nationwide screenings. Um, it's been wonderful to see the tour. In 2019, the International Film Festival at Rotterdam highlighted Smith's career through short and feature films and an installation and performance. And in art contexts, her vision expands from single screen works to multimedia and multi-channel installations, sculptures, drawings, textiles, performances and parades and more, as celebrated in solo exhibitions at the Whitney Museum of Art, Mass Mocha, and Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She's been recognized with awards from the Rockefeller Foundation, Creative Capital, United States Artists, as the inaugural recipient of the Ellsworth Kelly Award in 2016, the 2020 Studio Museum Joyce Alexander Wine Artist Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2021, just to name a few. She is faculty at UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture, and we're so thankful she snuck away from the start of the semester to join us here. Uh, for those who haven't yet, please visit our third floor and take ample time to sit with her work in musical thinking. Her neon sculptures are the capstone at each entrance and the wraparound installation at the end that holds her two videos inspired by Alice Coltrane is, I admit, a mini solo show I've nested into the group presentation. And also, know you can learn more about these works and all others in the show by downloading the free digital catalog from the exhibition webpage. So with, uh, with that, and without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome and invite you to help me welcome Colleen Smith to the stage. Hi. 
Hi, everyone. A lot of people are involved with um, making this all happen, and I thank all of them. Um, and so let's go. Uh, I have had the pleasure of spending the week here with my family, and we did all the tours, all the things, and um, I learned a lot, and I, I felt like, even though I know this is your home and you already know a great deal about this place, there are some things I learned about this particular cemetery and observed that actually I think I'm really gonna take with me, so I'm starting to talk to talk about them because I didn't realize when I went on that tour that it would actually be so closely related to the, a lot of the things I think about in my work. So it's been a wonderful week here in, in D.C. Um, um, and I, I, I think you guys all probably know that um, Arlington National Cemetery uh, was a plantation um, and that um, the uh, Lee Memorial House was the, the big house on that plantation and he and his wife inherited that land from who she was the, uh, I think, what, the great niece of George Washington. Her last name was Custis, and um, it was a really big operation when the Civil War happened. You guys know this, right? Yeah. So it's an open secret, because no one else knows this. Like, it's not taught, <laughs> and it's not discussed. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually shocked by that. Um, uh, I'll get back to this image here. I'm just putting it there as a placeholder. I'll get back to it. Um, and then there was also on this plantation during the Civil War, the erection of a freedman's town where newly emancipated or fugitive slaves built a community. You guys knew that, right? You knew that. OK, so that is also an open secret because I had no idea. I am profoundly shocked to have just learned that the cemetery was a plantation and that there was a town there that existed for 37 years until the government um, confiscated the property to expand the cemetery. Uh, these are just some views. This is a map of the Freedman's Village. I'm gonna move fast because you all know this, but these images will figure later. Um, this is an incredible image of uh, the citizens of the Freedman town. This is post-Civil War, all holding books. This is an incredible image. That's their, their structures behind them, which historians like to call temporary, but it's only temporary because the government demolished it, right? It wasn't temporary with intention. This is the garden that is a memorial to that, and to the left in this image, wait. Yeah, that little building <laughs> is the Park Service's uh, rendering of a slave cabin. Um, I, I, okay, well, get, I'm, I'm going to get it, there it is again. It used to be the gift shop and the bathrooms, but in 2019 they received a $12 million donation to turn it into a site to talk about the residents of this house, which was Selena Gray, who was uh, the mistress of the house's first, um, like, closest servant, and her family, her husband, and her eight children. This is a picture of her with her two daughters. Isn't that gorgeous? That's a gorgeous picture. And this is uh, the state, um, the National Parks um, uh, rendering, I guess, or re reconstituting of the Selena Gray home. It's cute, isn't it? It's so cozy. Um, they have two adults and one infant child standing in there. There would have been 10 people in this room, a small crawl space above where they um, uh, slept. Some of the children slept and um, an adjacent room, this room, which looks a little bit more like maybe how it may have been, um, a little closer to what may have been going on. I'll get back to all of why I'm doing this lecture. So I was really <laughs> like shocked by this room because it, it was so cozy and I just did not, I was, like, I was just confused. Um, the, the most confusing thing, and the reason why I had to pull this image off of the web, because I, I, it didn't even occur to me to take one, I was so shocked, was uh, to the right over there, there's a little kitten curled up sleeping. Um, as an art teacher, I've become accustomed to the way that artists are very suspicious of embellishments in artwork. Um, whether it is the swelling music in a movie or seemingly unnecessary flourishes on a painting, 
it's really frowned upon and it's almost, um, if, a, if one artist tells another artist your work is decorative or embellished, it could be received as a slur um, or, um, you know, a disparagement. Um, it, 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 su it suggests that maybe you are hiding something or you are failing to be clear or honest, like, like your artwork is dissembling. It's, it's, um, and, um, and that the embellishments are perceived often as crutches. And here in the slave cabin on the far right mixing with the pattern quilt is that gold ta uh, tabby cat. And when I walked in the exhibit and I saw that sleeping cat, I recognized it right away as an embellishment and as a form of dissembling. Um, there it is, I just had to highlight it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, this, this all is relevant to the work that I make because there's a lot of ways in which I do embellish and I do decorate. Um, and I was really stricken with like the very fine line of what it means to do that. Um, when are you dissembling? And when are you actually trying to do something else with those devices? A lot of my work for the past, oh, let's see, six or seven years, I've been making these heraldic banners. I've been showing them to you as I've been talking. Um, these are, the set that I'm gonna show you tonight are the most recent. Um, I finished this show at my gallery in Los Angeles um, in um, November. And um, the show is called My Cardera, and there are a series of 17 of these heraldic banners. This work is actually considering sort of like geologic time and extractive histories from extraction of human uh, and labor, but also extraction of the earth. And it's also um, asking people to maybe shift their perspective of what's going on with the climate and everything right now, because the world has actually already ended for some people who are living right day, and it's actually really seriously ended uh, five or six times. Um, so if we put that in perspective, and we think about the fact that this particular extinction is only occurring because of our behavior, it may shift the conversation from the one of dominion, from we have to save the planet, uh, to one of uh, self, uh, I don't know, inspection about like, how do we structure our society so that we can keep living on this planet? I'm thinking about extraction and human labor and, and human labor um, and, and on an industrial scale, but also um, on a very inti and an intimate level. And um, when we make these banners, they're based on drawings. And my pattern makers, they try to uh, keep the wobbliness of my lines as I'm drawing as a way of thinking and then they try and translate it, which is really vexing to a lot of people who sew because sewing is just like carpentry, right? It's about precision. It's about, you know, really, really beautiful and perfect joining of one fabric to another. And what I'm asking them to do is like keep all the wobbly lines and the warbly, the warping and all of the distortion that happens when I'm drawing really fast and just sort of like coloring things in. Um, that defective wriggle of the hand-drawn line is part of um, what I'm wondering, is that an embellishment? Am I dissembling or actually, am I actually trying to sort of like undermine what the power of these heraldic banners are doing? I kind of think I'm messing with the banner. Like a lot of people are offended by them because they are not crisp and perfect the way they're supposed to be. And they're instead, they're kind of like cuddly, frumpy and cuddly. Um, but then they say horrible things and they make accusations. Uh, this is an installation, so you see the banners in, in a sided, they're double-sided. Um, and um, what I'm trying to do is, um, my interest in forms is in forms of regalia and pageantry and how they're used. Any kind of nonverbal communication, I'm very interested in it, in t any kind of visual communication. Um, and I'm trying to use those instead of to um, instantiate uh, power um, and authority, which is how they are used. I'm actually trying to use them as signals to maybe declare uh, other events that I deem significant. You know, like a, a flag can be used from anything to, to like greet a neighbor or to warn an enemy. Um, and I'm still using them in that same way, but often at the same time. So when you encounter it, you're not sure if you're the friend or the neighbor, and that 
that reading could shift um, as you spend time with the, the banners. I'm going to play this film right now that is very much attached to the, the ritual of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I actually skipped a whole slide. I'm realizing that would have pulled them together. So let me talk about this right now. You look at this still. I apologize. Um, I've, I've been really, I was really stricken with that ritual, which I'm sure you guys have all seen more times than you care to recall. But it is a, it is a very, it is a perfect ritual. It does exactly what a ritual is supposed to do, which is it overrides any idea or thought you may have had about what was going to happen. You just submit to the ritual. I, I was just there, like sweating in the heat, just sort of like, OK, I'll watch this thing. I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm sure I've seen it on the news so many times, you know, Memorial Day. And once those soldiers entered into that space, and the, 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 the precision of their movements, the consideration, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect, and I know they train for that. But it made me really understand actually what a ritual is. A ritual isn't actually just something you make up and then you do. It's not even like, oh, I'm going to have a birthday party. A ritual is a kind of disciplined repetition that produces an a feeling, an affect in a community. Um, and, I, and, I, and I guess, um, obviously I knew that, but confronting these soldiers in the way in which that ritual overrode maybe my own presumptions about what I was going to see was like great art. <laughs> great art. And, um, and also, I'm very interested in this form of discipline that the military presents. It's something that uh, my um, research around Sun Ra um, got me thinking about because he has a lot of statements about you know black people are really concerned about freedom but if they were interested in discipline they would get a lot further he was very critical of, of his people um, and I've always I've always thought about that in relationship to his work and his compositions which are beautiful compositions but they have so much space for improvisation and they're so um, malleable and a different recordings of the same song have totally different shapes and tones. So at the same time that he's really interested in this real rigor, discipline, repetition, um, there's also this tension with improvisation. I'm going to get to that later, but I, I'm going to play this film, and I'm going to start it a little late, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to play the whole film. Let's see if it works. Should I tell you what it is before you watch it, or you want me to tell you after? Okay, sorry. I'm sorry.
to stop it there. So uh, this was a shot back in 2010. I apologize for the quality. It's actually very crisp. Um, I think it gets compressed in this software. Um, uh, this is a high school marching band from the south side of Chicago. Marching bands in Chicago are very competitive, like elite operations, as popular as the football teams that they play for. Um, um, it, was, it took some time to find Mr. Douglas, who's the man in the baseball cap leading them, who's willing to arrange a, a Sun Ra song for them to play, to do this flash mob. This was an unannounced uh, conflagration of marching band in the middle of Chinatown. And um, there was a lot that could be planned, but most of it had to be improvised on the spot. So there was a lot of preparation and conversation with the marching band, getting the arrangements, watching the rehearsals. And then they went off and rehearsed, and they did not invite me. So they made a lot of decisions that I was not privy to. And then we are, when we arrived, I was like, OK, how about we do this? They're like, no, no. We have a plan. I was like, oh, OK. So then the, the camera people then were forced to actually improvise completely. They had a plan, and so we're improvising around it. And so the video itself, in addition to the weather, uh, <laughs> um, um, produces this, in, uh, like, I think, um, a really nice tension between the discipline of these young people um, and the improvisation that we had to do to dis decide to capture it. There's a point where when it starts raining, I was certain that Mr. Douglas was going to, you know, tell them to wrap it up and march on into some shade. And that's when they doubled down, started singing, and like <laughs> pumping their instruments in the air. And, um, and I was like, ah, OK. So this is the discipline that I've been kind of interested in. So that's, that's why I wanted to like sort of connect those things. And I think, I'm, um, I think that there's a way in which these 75 individuals are working as one body that, to me, suggests great potential, and not just in its militaristic form, but in lots of different forms. And so by, I thought that by having the marching band be a flash mob, that they would sort of like enact um, just because they're forced in these conditions into a kind of chaos, but they didn't. They actually maintained complete cooperation and collaboration, and, 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 we, and they became the center of gravity that enabled that video to happen. Um, I'm going to keep moving. I just, I just found these images, and I was just really interested. I'm sorry. There's something I wanted to say here that is in my notes. Um, this is just all photojournalism documentation. Um, and I thought, and, I, and what's so interesting to me is I know exactly the, in their gestures what the moment is, because the, the ritual is so absolutely ingrained that even where they step, on the granite has the indentations. I'm sure many of you have noticed that. So you could actually predict even where they're going to step because their steps are the same size always, and they step in the same place always, and they have been for how long have they been doing that? Does anybody know? Oh, OK. Um, so I really, I was like, I was really, I was shook after I saw that. So I looked, I was like, what is a ritual? Why does it do that? How does it work? I really need to understand instead of playing or tinkering around with it in a superficial way. And so, you know, I went to Miriam Webster's, and these are excellent, this is an excellent, a, a ceremonial act or action, regular repetition, precise manner. That's like, I'm like, yes, I recognize this. But then I was like, well, what is improvisation? Because to me, they're in a dialectic, I think maybe in my work. Uh, what, Miriam Webster doesn't know what improvisation is, actually. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> this is the actual de definition of it. They don't know. But I know. And the jazz musicians know, actually, what it is. It's like you set up a structure inside of which a lot of things can happen. And you agree to allow those things to happen. People can stay inside of that pocket, that structure, those core projections, or they can actually choose to move it all into a totally different, unpredictable direction. And the people they're playing with make a decision too. Do I go with them? Do I argue with them? Do I hold them back? Do I like double down on this beat so they have to stay on it? Or do we just go? Like, and to me, improvisation is truly radical because of this way in which there is a structure and then there is an agreement, but there is also an agreement that anyone in that uh, collaboration 
has the power to change the direction of that experiment, of that moment together. That is so interesting to me. It's just as interesting as uh, the structure and precision and repetition of ritual. And I think my work, I just realized that it's constantly kind of pushing between those two things. And the film upstairs, I think you'll kind of see some of those tensions played out as well. So I'm, now I'm gonna, get to, I'm gonna get to some of that. I'm gonna show you the piece that Sojourner came out of and how I've been playing with this um, tension of like the heraldic, the structure, the rigorous, the, uh, uh, the sort of like over, um, the overpowering and then chaos. So this is literally an, a f version of this installation of a show called Give It or Leave It when it was installed in the Fry Museum in Seattle. And you, in, like you're greeted with these, these banners um, which are mimicking a kind of um, requiem, a kind of like Catholic requiem kind of um, style banner. But then you're invited into a room of total chaos. I mean, in this image, I don't know any other word to describe this image besides loud. <laughs> it's a very loud image. Um, and there is actual sound in the room, but the, the, the sound in the room is quite soothing. It's very ambient, it's birds, it's wind, it's water. Maybe there's a sound of a car or a train or a, a, an airplane. But the, the real noise in the room are all of the things happening that you have to actually sit down with and, and pick apart on your own, on, on, on your own time. And then eventually realize that what you're seeing on the table is also what you're seeing all around you. Um, this idea that I want my spectators to enter into an agreement with the installation so that when they walk in, there are a lot of things that are not explained, but there is a way in which you can make these connections or suppositions for yourself. I think it's so interesting the way that art is kind of like an inside conversation, right? And I actually never really know what's going on in art either, but I can discern, especially if you look at an artist's work over and over or you encounter it multiple times, that a lot of artists are interested in the same thing and they're just working through it. And so it's the repetition that makes their work cohere. And even when they experiment and go, totally off book. A lot of artists are actually discouraged from doing that because they've found a thing that's profitable, but it's hard to stay doing this thing when you know that if you just go over here, something's gonna happen and you don't even know what it is, but it's gonna be interesting. So I love the way that artists do that and I thought, ah, this is the artists in their studio producing sort of like these ritualistic actions with their materials, whether it's paint or wood or textiles. Uh, a kind of repetition because they're, they're, they have a question and that through the repetition of this, they actually might be able to produce a thing that coheres so well that it even overrides someone else's presumptions or desires about what that work should do, kind of the way the, the um, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Marines did for me. Um, this is another installation. It's a big, quiet room that has things that are completely bombastic and then just huge sections of empty space. Um, and to me that has a lot to do with thinking about the spectator themselves. And um, uh, even, so I make a very, very noisy room and then the next room you, that you might go into is gonna be really quiet, really minimal and really spare, just to give you a space. And I'm very interested in making installations as opposed to discrete objects. All the things go together, you'll see upstairs that the video is in a room with some disco balls and there's a, there's a photograph on the wall, there's wallpaper, and to me, all of those things depend on one another to produce uh, a conversation with you, the spectator. If I have any of them alone, I don't really think they stand up. I didn't make them to stand up on their own. I made them to be together and I made them actually to be containers for the spectator. That's the most important part of the, what the, the activity of the installation is supposed to do. Um, yesterday, uh, Saisha and I were talking about light and sound and um, leaks and uh, the desire to control them. And if, as if, if you're a video artist, you're constantly confronted with two things in art galleries. One, they don't want to make the room dark enough most of the time. And 
Two, they actually want to put your work on headphones, even though you spend all this time mixing the sound and making it gorgeous for a room. Um, because they don't want, you know, the vibrations of the sound will somehow impact the way you experience this silent painting on the wall. I don't know. I don't know. I, and I don't actually accommodate it um, if I can avoid it because um, I think that the, the most, the, the feralness of light and sound are like my, they're like my two favorite materials. Like, so instead of, instead of trying to um, control them, I just, I don't know, augment them so that they're working with the space. Um, I do need a room to be dark so that you can see an image, you know, but I also um, need, um, I also think that light coming into the room that is actual sunlight kind of reminds you of where you are. Like, if you're in there long enough, the shadows on the floor are going to move and you are reminded that, you know, we're on a planet that's rotating around the sun. Like, just because there's a big red streak of a shadow on the floor, like, it reminds you that this is occurring all the time, which is crazy if you think about it. That's crazy. All right, so um, in that noisy room, how those rooms are made when all those video projections are happening. In this picture, you can see a CCTV camera there at the end of the table. Lots of objects on these tabletops that are kind of democratically spread around. Um, and um, they're, they're um, not arbitrarily, they're arbitrarily collected, but not arbitrarily um, arranged. I'm usually making a tabletop into a kind of landscape that has a narrative. Um, and I usually um, try and use um, enough objects that have a real palpable familiarity to the spectator so that I, that I can trust them to have a feeling about that object and trust them to in, invest it with their own narrative. I don't have to tell them much. There are also strange things that I've made mixed in there. Um, and, and it's um, um, objects from many different periods, from the contemporary and the brand new to antique, let's like say, Dogon figurines or something, um, all mixed together, from a plastic crow mask to a rock I found in the, in the museum parking lot. So they're all kind of democratically put on the table and then that CCT camera reframes them and changes how they look and they get projected elsewhere in the room, like away from the, the table where you see the objects. So it will take you a minute to understand that these objects that you see on the table are actually hovering above you somewhere else in the room. So this tabletop here um, is this projection up here. So the way that, it, I find it really disturbing the way that the camera crops and leaves so much out. Like you actually can't know the full story from the way that the lens captures things. And, and that, of course, is the point. I mean, not to be too didactic, but I'm actually talking about sort of like this problem with cinema and how it really is, it, 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 it tells you that everything you're seeing is true and, and we think that something is good when it's realistic. And we don't like to notice when there's an edit. We want to just flow through the space and that it feels real that way. And in that seduction that cinema does, we're being, I think, kind of infantilized in a way where our curiosity or our participation in the image is, is greatly diminished. Um, and so instead of making narrative cinema, that flows and seduces you and lulls you into this like really cool story, pow, 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 everything is from different angles, but it's all making sense. I really, really kind of break things apart so that you're constantly having to um, work your own way through the images instead of me just kind of like spoon feeding you. As, and it's particularly disturbing to me when it's violent imagery where that's happening, is I'm just not sure what's happening to us. Um, I'm just throwing these banners in. Uh, the banners, these banners are, if you probably discern, they're really thinking about geologic time, but also in relationship to contemporary and political culture and, and like recent history, say histories of like two or three or four or 500 years, which when you start thinking about rocks, 500 years is like yesterday, right? Um, and I'm really thinking about rocks, making these uh, geologic objects um, that are, I don't know, speculative uh, topographies 
that are actually candles. They're made out of wax and they only are really activated when they burn. Um, and you know, they're made in a mold, but the, the layers like mimic um, geological striation, the way like, like you can, you know, if you see a cliff side and you see all the different colors of earth, the iron oxide and the ochre, the granite, the marble, the dolomite, blah, blah, blah. These are trying to do the same thing, but in, in a, a way that also is kind of winking at, I don't know, abstract painting maybe, <laughs> cheekily, <laughs> not me, I don't know, okay. And then um, and the, the, the candles to me are, um, I don't know, sort of like signifiers of our, our price, presence, like the close I would, closest I would come to putting a figure in a three-dimensional object that, you know, um, I can't help but think that, you know, the planet is fine and we're the problem. And so this work, this whole body of work is thinking about that sort of like moving the anxiety away from, oh, that hurricane or, oh, that hurricane that we just had in, <laughs> in California or, um, you know, the tornado and shifting it back more towards like, how is our, why is our society structured in such a way that I am so worried about putting this aluminum can in a trash can and because I can't find a recycling bin and how is this my sole and lone responsibility? And, and what does it really matter where I throw this thing anyway? Because there's a billion of them out there. And that feeling, the way in which the way we have structured society produces that hopelessness or this sort of like indifference, like this is just the way it is. And this is the way it will be. And we just have to sort of embrace this. That whole problem is kind of what I was asking people to consider in this work. Here's another one of the, they're called unconformities because in the, in earth geology, when you see one a slant of like striation run into another at a different angle, that's what they call that, an unconformity, which I just thought was perfect. That's, that's, thank you, geology. for that. Geology has a great, a lot of great language. Um, let me see if I can show you some more pictures of them burning. There's a, um, and so like when I was working on this, I was trying, I was thinking about like, what is life exactly? Like, what is the definition of life? And this is actually a, a very common definition of life. Design is any system capable of performing functions, eating, metabolizing, excreting, breathing, moving, growing, reproducing, and responding to external stimuli. And the planet actually does all those things. The planet does all of those things and it makes it possible for us to do those things. I'll just leave that there. I don't really wanna preach or anything. I actually don't have any solutions, only questions. But this question of like, how do we, how have we come to produce this hierarchy of what is life, what is human, what is sentient, what has feelings, that's, that's, mm, it's of interest to me of like exploring that and trying to make I don't know, objects that trigger these questions. Um, that's another one of that. That's like a detail of one of the candles. And here's another one. And these have shown now quite a bit um, and have burned way down like that. No longer looks like that. It's actually caved in and spilled into that hole. And they just get better and better as, as, they, as they burn, I think. Um, I guess I must have just lit them and taken a snap. I was so excited to finally burn them. Um, and then making these haikus out of geological talk, like what geologists are trained to do is um, measure things and train to find things. So they learn about the Earth's processes and how it lives so that they can figure out, predict where stuff's gonna be like oil or diamonds or lithium. So they can like look at a landscape and say, I think the lithium's gonna be here, down here because this and this and this, right? Okay. So that's, it's so interesting to me because I feel like if you are interested in Earth's processes, you're kind of like an artist. It's a weird thing to be into, just like rocks and like, like what is the planet doing and its behavior. So I feel like, you, and then, but then your only job, if you're a geologist, if you don't become an academic, a scholar, um, is to go and find stuff and extract it. And I, 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 I bet everybody here knows a geologist that doesn't do geology. It's kind of like being an artist. 
like everybody like knows like an art, someone who went to art school and, and now they're like a terrific lawyer or you know what I mean or maybe a, a something else you know what I mean and geology is the same way where like people study it and they go off and do something else because like the option their options are kind of almost contrary to what made them fall in love with that field of study in the first place um, and, and I guess I was thinking about that in terms of how they have to write. They have to measure everything and they have to describe everything and everything has to have a name and they're always naming things after themselves. And that, that's got to feel weird, right? You find like a five billion year old crystal and then you name it Stevenite. I mean, can you, can you imagine? That's like, they do that. That's what they do. I, it's really odd. Um, um, so I, f I think of these banners as, as comprising a, a procession, a slow dirge that is basically about the fall of our empire. Um, and like banners like this are um, talking about like the possibilities in that, that we actually not, don't have to go through this isolated and alone. That would be a choice. Um, and um, also a reminder that for some people, particularly in North America, like if you're First Nations, you already had the, the apocalypse happen. It already happened. And you're, you have survived it, and you're still walking through the ruins of it every day. Um, so welcome. Um, all of these ideas I like, I do a lot of reading and note taking, and so I made this manifesto, which is basically just a kind of collection of um, all the people that I'm reading or listening to, a lot of YouTube lectures and quotes that helped me kind of think about uh, these issues that are kind of verging um, questions around the human with geology, around the social, sociality, how to imagine it, what to think about it, what's possible, et cetera. Um, and um, even though I'm a filmmaker, I have a lot of trouble with the human figure. Like um, you'll see in the film above, like I like having more than one person in the frame I don't really like to just do these like close-ups where you gaze upon an individual's face and they are imbued with all of this sort of like cinematic beauty and power. I like to have lots of people together in the frame. Um, and then in, in some ways, I, I also, in, in the Sojourner, that film, I, I do this thing that's actually, you know, it's really terrible, which is I even turn the individual, I like, I like make them so neutral by having them do something like carry a banner so that their identity gets subsided by the information that's on the banner so then they become like in service of an idea as opposed to individuals. Um, and so these, these ceramics were the beginning of trying to think about how to do figures without making figures. And I was, tr I was planning a procession that was gonna be another dirge. I really love like the second line and like I like the, I like the um, rituals around death. I think they're um, maybe uh, they're always w a lot more formal and there's a lot less desire to be creative with a, a death ritual in the way that like maybe a wedding ritual, there's like a desire to have it be memorable so it has to be crazy, something has to happen, it has to be gorgeous, these flowers have to come in from Madagascar, you've never seen this flower, like stuff like that has to happen. But with a, uh, but with a funeral, it's just like this happens, and then someone says something, and then this happens, and here you go. I got to go home and take a nap. And like that ritual is very comforting because you know what's going to happen. Um, so, and I, that was, I don't know how I got talking about that. I'm sorry. What I want to say about these figures, they're called Sinners Keep on Trying, and each vessel is named after an African American celebrity who fell from society's grace in some way. I can't, I actually can't recall the name of this particular one, but they have names like Old Dirty Bastard or Michael Jackson or Kanye or like, you know what I mean? Like even Whitney Houston or like, um, like beloved, beloved stars that then got taken down maybe by their poor decisions, but <laughs> also mainly by the way the media consumed them. Um, and they're incense burners. So I was making this, um, smoke bomb basically that had a colored smoke, a noxious colored smoke, but a really healing scent like myrrh or copal so that it would look scary and toxic but smell really healing and cleansing. Um, and the smoke to me was a, about um, trying to make a picture of interiority about 
the really complex feelings of like sometimes you experience as a black person in America where people really can't know what you're thinking. They can't. You can't. They can't know. Um, and so this smoke is sort of like the signifier of that. Um, yeah, a kind of inaccessible interiority. And then uh, when I was putting this video in, I was realizing that I think maybe fire is like that third material that you can't control that I really like. And you're not really allowed to play with it in museums. Um, so, so the only place those big candles have, um, have um, shown is in private art galleries where the space is, they're willing to take that chance. But I, I can't imagine them being in a place like the Smithsonian. I think people would just have a stroke. <laughs> so we're back to the Freedman's Town. Um, this is another one of those images where we just saw this today because we were at the Blacksonian. And um, they had this picture very large on the wall. Um, and this is a Freedman town after the Civil War also. And to me, this looks like people really making a little world for themselves. Um, and I can't help but think, wonder, it's just sort of like the, what is that, Weeksville? In, that was Central Park in New York. And like almost every major American city went about this business of evacuating people who built a world out of, like made a way out of no way so that they could then, I don't know, put down a freeway or I don't know, a, a plaisance of some kind, an aqueduct, whatever, something like significantly less lively than this image suggests there, what was there. Or a, or, oh, a cemetery, significantly less lively. Um, so I'm gonna end um, this talk, because uh, I look forward to your questions with, um, these are just some more images of how, again, in my installations, everything is working together, and I'm going to end the talk with showing that film that's in the corner over there. But uh, in my mind, like, all of these things, again, are really dependent on one another. Um, if the banners ever get to be in a live procession, there would also need to be candles involved, and there would also need to be some kind of music that's like the music that's going to be in the video, and I warn you, it's quite loud. Also, you'll see in there, I augmenting the, the light spill again, so that um, um, it's just just dark enough for the video to have um, some luminosity and then making the gallery paint the walls purple and red, which they weren't really. <clears throat> it looks so good though, right? So they had to. Um, all right, so this film is called My Caldera. Um, it's directly related to the Volcano Manifesto. Um, the soundtrack is by two really wonderful young musicians, Sal and Diego Rivera from Los Angeles. Um, and it's a proposal about uh, the end of the world. Ready?
I broke your system. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so that film is made by reprinting TikTok videos of um, volcanoes onto actual film with a laser printer, frame by frame, and then uh, splicing it back together into film, then getting it digitized, and then re-editing it. So that textile-like texture, the distortions, and all the scratches has to do with all the handling that happens with this really imprecise kind of printing. And I think that I would really like to hear your questions now. So thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, I'll just escape and close it. Okay. Oh, now I'm showing you all my business. Stop. <laughs> Hang on. Oh my gosh. How do I unplug? Okay. So please think of questions. If you haven't, write them down on the cards. We're going to collect them and on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah? OK. We're all here. Um, First, I just want to thank you, Colleen, so much for that um, really um, site-specific talk. I think it's really wonderful to feel um, how much you thought about the place and the experience here and brought it into connection with your work. Uh, I think sometimes we move through this space not always attending to what it the, the meaning and the deep history and these questions of sort of who's been moved um, to make room for this architecture of empire as we were talking about. So thank you for calling that into the space. Um, I wanted to start, I'm sure they're collecting some, but I was really struck by the punk aesthetic of that last film. And um, you know, my show's called Musical Thinking, and one of the prompts was really that there's a way in which um, these understandings of what the aesthetic of music is and what the possibilities of sonic philosophy are and how those get mined by visual artists and specifically video artists. So can you talk about um, this, this the move to punk and then also just in a more general way how music has um, informed these different moments in your, um, in your career, looking at Sun Ra, looking at Alice Coltrane, these kinds of things. Yeah, sure. Um, well, that, that film is really ruminating on the power of the volcano, both as a destructive force, but also as a regenerative force, because it literally makes new land. Like, uh, Iceland is, like, cracked open and is splitting and, like, moving. It's getting wider. It's, like, more land. So it's a, this combination of, like, um, the destructive and the regenerative and celebrating that, which... I feel like metal is um, not afraid of um, that sort of like a, a kind of violent sound, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Or um, a terror. Uh, it just seemed like the perfect soundtrack for an erupting volcano. And so, what? Like it's just um, just really trying to have the sound and the subject, and then also the actual material of the film mm -hmm. really speaking to each other. And so the way that you make this film is. There's no way to make a nice, clean image because you're taping the film onto paper, sending it through an inkjet, mm -hmm. and ink gets smeared, and you have to untape it, scrape tape off, retape it, all these, splice it together, you know what I mean? And yeah. so that also is really hand, it's a lot of hand work. It's just like sort of like stitching um, patches onto your clothes with dental floss, and like, <laughs> it's just like a kind of tedious thing, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that um, the idea of kind of co celebrating the after and the fall is something that's in punk and in metal, and so bringing that into the subject and into the way you treat the material in the film um, was really powerful. Yeah. 
I have a question from the audience. Um, in your installations, are you making objects or do you use found objects? Um, is there a ritual involved in gathering the objects back to ritual? Uh, uh, those tabletops, so it's a combination of found objects or some are really procured. Like sometimes I'll see an African figurine and it's the perfect one and I have to just pay for it. Um, um, but then there are a lot of made objects or um, uh, yeah, augmented mm -hmm. objects, um, found, collected, and it's everything from thrift shops to uh, anytime I find something, uh, anything I find something that might be able to participate on a tabletop, I just get it. Depending, I mean, depending on price. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Do you have a kind of I don't know a, a area in your studio that's just this kind of like archive of possibility? Archive's a really nice word for the mess <laughs> that is like of several, three shelves of just stuff that it needs, it needs more like six shelves, but it's all crammed on the three shelves. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Well, I have to say that body of work, encountering it, blew my mind, really. The, the way you were describing the relationship between the participation of figuring out what's happening mm -hmm. um, as you move through those spaces. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you really walked us through that because mm -hmm. it is mind-bending, but it is also points to the space, how different that is from the way we're asked to not um, unpack the, mm -hmm. the visual landscapes in other, in other spaces. Um, and also, can you talk a little bit about the ceramics and the wax work? This is work that I haven't seen in person. It was really exciting to see that. Yeah, when I first got into ceramics, I really wasn't even trying to make any kind of form. I was just interested in the alchemy. It is mm -hmm. really one of the coolest materials, right? It's dirt and water and fire and air, and that is all it is. And it's like this plastic stuff, clay. You can make it do anything if you know how. Mm -hmm. And, but but it, it only stays that way if you put it through these processes like it's, that's basically like being in the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought that was cool and I thought maybe I can do something with this material that's talking about the pro processes of the earth. But the, the thing about it is that once you fire it, it's static and it's done. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. wax actually does that same mimicry, but it actually never fixes and it never, it, it, it never rests. Yeah. yeah. We've got a question that I really love. Um, can you speak to the relationship between vulnerability and authenticity as it relates to your art and life? Um, maybe this is, people are struck by the, the candidness of the talk. I don't know, like you're, you're, you're so clear about sort of your personality in that moment. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm projecting into this, but this is the question. Hmm. Vulnerability and authenticity in the work I can talk about. I'm not yeah. sure. I didn't, did I? I, I gave a lot of opinions, mm -hmm. but did I? Really I did, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry, um, but I didn't. I didn't. I, I was thinking about it in relationship to the work. Um, I think um, maybe that goes back to like me just starting to dig into this idea around embellishment and dissembling, and um, uh, what are what are the ethics around certain kinds of omissions and certain kinds of presentations? And I try to be very careful about how much of my personal narrative I put into the work. Like, I could have told you that I really love marching bands, probably because my brother was in marching bands. I was an orchestra nerd. My brother, who is here, he was in marching bands. And I just love them. And, um, and then just learned more about them, like, in my studies. But you don't really need to know that to watch the film or so. Authenticity, I'm just not sure. I actually am not sure about authenticity. I'm not sure mm -hmm. anybody is required to be authentic for anybody else or if a thing needs to be authentic to be loved or cared for, it can be a big fat fake and still be cool. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm not sure about either of those things in terms of values in my work. Okay. Um, here's another question um, that uh, came in. How do you approach giving instructions to other creatives. Um, so you collaborate, you know, or we do museum <laughs> installations and working with the marching band. Um, and then there's another word I can't read down here if anybody wants. It says museums. Sewers, like the people who craft your bears. Oh, the uh, sewers, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> what about them? Oh. How do you, how do I talk to them? Yeah. I, for, I call them seamsters. Because you know they're they're all really young, and the the pronoun situation is really real, 
And so you can't call them the seamstresses, which I hate anyway. And so where it sounds like it could be anything. So I call them seamsters because they kind of are like this, like teamsters, like, and they, they do occasionally revolt. And so um, <laughs> I think well, the first thing is just finding the, the, the seamsters who will uh, work, work with me the way I want to work, where a straight line isn't the priority or I'm often using the wrong material for the job because it, like those banners that you saw, all the edges, which should be crisp and smart if they're a real banner, they're all made out of like a terry velour. So they're all just like wobbly to make crooked lines. And I had one seamster just quit on me after one banner. And they, they were just frustrated that they couldn't do their best work. And so it has to be people who know how to sew, but are not invested in the values of sewing like precision. You know what I mean? Um, and can see the final outcome. Where I'm like, I literally needed to look like this drawing here. We see how that ink is bleeding there? Do that with the sequins and that kind of thing. And they get into it. They get really into it to the point where then they don't want me telling them how to do it. Like, you know what I mean? But it takes uh, time and um, conversations. And uh, they have to get familiar with the materials because I'm always using the wrong material for the thing that they have to do with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, here's a question that asks, um, some years back you talked about light in filmmaking, which was also something you talked about tonight, and its effect on dark things. You hope to make dark things be embraced by filmmaking outside of light. I guess this person um, knows a quote back or something. Does any of that sound familiar? Can you read that? Sure, sure. Some years back, you talked about light in filmmaking and its effect oh. on dark things. Oh. You hope to make dark things be embraced by filmmaking outside of light. How has that been, if at all, for you? So I guess I think when they say dark things, they may mean black people. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I think. I, yes, but that's not all you said. <laughs> Oh, wow, that was a long time ago. Okay, um, well, yes, I mean, in general. Yeah, almost every film I make looks different from every other film. Um, because it just depends on what the subject matter is. But yeah, I would still stand by this idea around um, thinking about how to light dark people and dark things and the way in which the technologies that we have to do this work of capture is really working against that. And so um, instead of trying to make the technology do it perfectly, I kind of like letting the technology fail but still producing some kind of feeling that is, is um, palpable. I don't know if that is speaking to what you're talking about. Okay. Um, this is a question I actually had in watching the, um, f or seeing the images of the unconformities lit. Um, how do you imagine the lifespan of those works? Actually, they can be refilled. Um, it's possible because of the, they just burn down like a pillar candle, so they leave a tube. So I can replace the wick and I can refill it with new striations, which I'm really hopeful. I'm hopeful that someone will want one and then I get to have that relationship with that them comes. and the candle. Yeah, because they really need to burn and then they need to be refilled. They, and they, they, sh they can be. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of, I'm really hopeful I get to do that. But if I get them back, like if someone doesn't take them, I'm just going to burn them in my backyard, you know, because they're so fun. And the test candle that I made, I did it at a residency, and everyone was just like eating pizza and staring at this thing melt, and it was just the best. So I'm, I can do that. I love that idea. Yeah. <laughs> I want to come over. Uh, so welcome. there's two good but big questions. I'm going to ask both of them. We have time for one more, and you can pick which one you want to end on. Okay. okay. So um, one is from online. It says, how do you think of experimental non-narrative film as part of your toolbox? Which feels very large. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is, how do you think Sun Ra would describe the dialectical tension between discipline or ritual or improvisation that you theorized? I'm not sure his op he operated with a recognition of this binary. No. Um, I'll do the second question first, because 
as much as I learned from Sun Ra, we do stuff different. <laughs> um, I mean, he he was really interested in discipline and repetition, and he would he would work his his band like he would have eight hour rehearsals that were interrupted maybe by a two hour lecture of him rambling on. Um, and there's a lot of audio recordings that you can get of these rehearsals where it's just not even melodies that you hear on any of his recordings, like a melody that maybe John Gilmore invented that then they all have to build harmonies around and they just do it over and over. Um, that's really cool. I don't, I don't uh, work that way. I don't think he was interested in improvisation in the way that I am, but he definitely enacted it whether he would talk about it that way or not. If you ever saw the art, if you see any films of the orchestra, there is a bombastic um, um, anarchy that happens at moments, but then is like reined in. So it's all sort of like, um, the, there's someone making that decision and it seems like it was Sun Ra. Um, I'm talking about, I'm thinking about improvisation in that regard more like, the Chicago like um, art ensemble or the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, who would literally, as an orchestra, make a live composition together, mm -hmm. which is very, excuse me, very difficult to do and very amazing to watch. Like I've never seen anything like it. Um, so there is a conductor, but there's this like constant conversation with everyone about how they're going to contribute to the idea that they're constructing. It's really interesting. Beautiful. Uh, the other question was about the toolbox of filmmaking, which I think anything I make, even if it's a candle, I think because of my training as a filmmaker, I think of everything almost like a film. Like In my mind, the candles could be in a film, or uh, the banners are almost always made with a, a procession in mind that I would want to film, whether that happens or not. And, and, and even the way that I construct the kind of conceptual frame for the work has a lot to do with how I would maybe design a narrative on a film. I, I spend a lot of time writing screenplays. So even if I take all the, I like vacated of narrative, I'm using that structure to make it, to make, maybe to make the installation. Like a lot of my installations have acts. They have, I feel that. yeah. Well, those were all incredibly insightful and so um, provocative. And thank you, audience, for, for showing up for that. Yeah, thank, so you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so much. This, this, a quick reminder, there is a reception for people in person um, upstairs in Kogod. Please join us. Um, yeah, so we can continue the conversation. And thaw out. Because it's cold. And thaw out. Yeah. <laughs>